roll call, I think. Let's see, we got uh, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven. Who's missing? Lonnie. 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 Okay. Lonnie's late sometimes. Okay. Oh. Well, that's, uh, and Lonnie. we have guests. We have, um, see, you'll be under the public to be heard. Yes. And we have um, uh, Bianca, Brandy, Crystal, uh, so, so is it? Salazar. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and would you introduce yourself, please? Sure. My name is John Pillman. John Pillman. P I W R M A W. Okay. All right. There's there she is. Okay. So I guess we got we got a full compliment. Did I miss anybody? All right. We got another guest. Yeah. Lonnie just came in. All right. There's a lot of guests over there. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Marta Moreno. She's going to join us today uh, just to see what we do, right? How good we are, or whatever. <laughs> okay, glad to have you. Thank you. All right, uh, approval of the agenda. Uh, has everybody had a chance to look at the agenda? Yeah. Are there any changes to the agenda? If not, uh, are you moving to approve the agenda? Okay, I move to approve. John seconds. All those in favor of approving the agenda say aye. aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Approval of the previous month's minutes. Uh, are there any corrections or additions to last month's minutes? But, Okay, all right. I'm easily distracted. And sorry for the distractions. All right. Um, there are no corrections or additions to the minutes. Will someone make a move to adopt them? I'll make the move. Okay, Arlene makes a move to adopt them. Is there a second? Eric adopts them. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Public invited to be heard. That's going to be Francis Jaffe. Did I get that right? You did get that right. Okay, would you introduce yourself? And uh, you've got about, well, we follow the city rule of three minutes, but. I can you know, do, I can, I'll be quick, I'll be three minutes. Um, okay. So, my name is Francie Jaffe. I'm the internal sustainability coordinator with the City of Walnut Sustainability Office. Um, so, my primary role is I work internally helping staff apply sustainability to their work. Um, I have a couple updates related to extreme heat. Um, so I have some of them written on my phone so I got them right. Uh, Zach Lance has presented to you all recently and got feedback from you all, so I have a quick update from him. Um, we've completed about 20 interviews with older adults, particularly in high heat island, high risk neighborhoods, and deployed an interactive cooling solution voting display, which he discussed when he presented to you all in the past. In the next few months, we'll be analyzing the results and planning 2025 engagement and comps. So we just wanted, uh, since you all gave great feedback, um, to provide that update to you all. And then related to extreme heat, um, the climate uh, risk mapping tool um, that the city has developed that staff are using to help identify those extreme heat neighborhoods, um, it's very data driven. It has a lot of, it's basically neighborhoods based on uh, a variety of different data factors, but we really like to tell that human story along with it. So right now we have one uh, community video. Um, we're currently in the progress of a second community video, and um, I'm looking for another one to do this year. Um, we're focusing on extreme heat, which I realize is a funny day to come talk to you about extreme heat. It's, there's snow on the ground, um, but I we are also happy if folks wanted to talk about poor air quality, flooding, or extreme cold, or other topics um, that are on the climate risk mapping tool. I believe either you've already gotten or should get an email from me kind of stating this already, but I also just wanted to come explain it in person and drop off some of my cards. Um, if anyone is interested in being interviewed for a video, um, we're hoping to do one more by the end of the year, or if you know someone who you think would be interested in being interviewed for a video, uh, these videos will go on our city YouTube page where you might use them if we're presenting to council to talk about extreme heat to kind of bring that community story as well as go on our climate risk mapping tool page. Uh, 
if we may if I have more than one person interested, we are hoping to do more interviews next year as well. I just don't know as much about the timing. It all depends on our staff who's helping us with the video and the editing on what their capacity is, but we are hoping to do one more interview um, this year. So I just wanted to, to kind of explain that in person and drop off my cards. And that, that's it for me. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, is there, uh, Arlene. So I understand this extreme heat part. Are we doing anything about cold? So right now, a lot of the prioritization has been on extreme heat as developing programs. Our Emer Office of Emergency Management has more experience with extreme cold. Um, so I know right now we are working with them on more of an extreme weather plan that can talk about extreme cold and extreme heat. Um, over time, we're also expecting there to be less extreme cold days and more extreme heat days. So extreme heat has been more of a priority um, over extreme cold. So not as much work on that. Randy? Um, Kevin Esmail from the city's emergency management um, division yes. uh, is going to be coming, I believe, at the beginning of December. It's in the general interest section of the GO and doing a talk called Be Ready, Long yes. Month that is really about all kinds of extreme weather events and how you can be prepared for them. If yeah. that is of interest to the board, you might want to check that out. Yeah, and Kevin will have the most uh, the most information about what the city is doing around extreme cold. It's just not something the sustainability office specifically has focused extensively on. Do you want us to call you, or do you want us uh, today to let you know if we're interested? Or um, if there's someone interested today, you can let me know, or I am, or you can give me a call or send me an email. Someone can let me know maybe for next week if you're interested. Otherwise, I might just kind of go keep going down my list of trying to find someone. So if yeah, there's someone right now who's like, yes, I'm interested, that's great. I can follow up with you after the meeting. If not, you can think about it and give me a call. Anybody want to volunteer today? <laughs> I guess not. That's okay. I'm, not, I'm finding that I, I not would a lot do of people want to be videoed. So. I would do it, but my experiences are really boring. So I don't know. We can but, always talk about it, and yeah. then we can, because. Uh, yeah. Okay. 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 So we get just get in touch with you. Yeah, I'll put these okay. over on this table over here, and All right. thank you for having me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Thank you. All right. Uh, old business. Am I on the right spot? Old business. Um, before we get into that, I don't know what, I haven't talked to any of you, so I don't know uh, what you've got to say. Uh, but I'm just thinking, remember, just working backwards, we uh, wanted to make a presentation if we had a recommendation to uh, City Council in April. We wanted to meet with uh, uh, um, Harold. Harold. I wanted to say Howard, and he was with to Harold in March. So that gives us, uh, well, it gives us next meeting, January and February, to kind of get our thoughts together. So I guess I'm thinking, uh, you know, by February, we really need to have our thoughts pretty well together. And so um, I guess, you know, I guess I jumped ahead here, didn't I? I should, go, I should let, Dia trans let Dia go ahead with the presentation. So, uh, would you introduce the subject and yeah. we'll listen to that first. Okay. Well, I'm Crystal Salazar. I'm with the Mobility uh, Paratransit. I'm a mobility specialist. I do um, the outreach events, presentations, getting our clients registered and set up. Uh, registered and set up with VIA. <laughs> um, but so what VIA offers, we are a paratransit transportation. We service anyone that is 60 and up or with a disability um, qualifies. Uh, we do transportation in the Boulder County area. So it is um, Boulder within Boulder, Longmont, Louisville, Lafayette, and Superior. It is a Monday through Friday service. It runs from 8 a.m. to 4 30 p.m. We do transportation such as medical, grocery shopping, clients that would like to come to the senior center, um, visit a family member, or go to the library, or go out to have lunch with a friend. There is a shared, it is a shared ridership, so it is first come, first serve. Um, and what else is there? There is a fair cost. There is a fair cost of $6 one way, $6 back within the city limits. If like if they're in Longmont going 
to King Supers off of Main Street, so it'd be like six dollars there, six dollars back. Now let's say they wanted to go into Boulder, there is a fair cost of twelve dollars one way, twelve dollars back. Um, there is a reduced fare that we do have. They would have to qualify with their yearly income to see where their guidelines are. But other than that, we also service the Well County area. We do Estes Park within Estes Park. Um, with Well County area, we are expanding out in that area where we can take clients from Greeley to Brighton. The furthest we can go up to is 120th. Some parts of Cheyenne, Wyoming to the VA Medical Center out there for veterans. And I'm trying to think what else we're doing. We're hoping that we can get Larimer County to provide transportation service out there as well for clients say that Longmont, we have a lot of Longmont residents that want to go into Lumber to medical appointments, which we can't do right now. Uh, we can get the approval of the learner to get that, to get them out there. And I know we just got Millican. Millican, we now started providing service out in Millican for clients out there as well. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yes. There's a number of uh, Buses or uh, individuals you have working during the day. Uh, day so, how many bus drivers we have for the Boulder County? Well, I guess what I'm looking at is how many you have per day available, um, because that's going to lead into my next question, which is, <clears throat> are you able to meet the, the time factors? Or so that is a good that? question. So right now we go based on more funding. So our funding we get from the city grants, uh, where we get our funding from and from the counties. So when we do get that, um, I know they check every year to see where we're at, to see how many drivers we can hire and our, where we're at full capacity. So like for instance, right now for Denver County, we service Denver County, but right now we're at full capacity because we don't have the funding from Jefferson, Adams, or Apaho, or uh, I can't remember the other county. So right now we're at full capacity. We're still assisting trips for those clients, but we cannot register anyone new because we don't have enough drivers. But right now for the Boulder County area, we're at a good spot where we do have enough drivers to get the clients where they need to go. And then sometimes like it is availability, so it does qualify to see where they come, like first come, first serve. So say that, you know, you call at 8 a.m. and you're lucky that you get that trip. Um, so what it is, is like, say we get there at 9, we get picked back up, but it is based off of the ability as well, and we're hoping to expand more to get more funding to get the drivers, to get our drivers. So there's no guarantee like that on a medical issue that somebody needs to do a doctor. There's yeah. no guarantee that so they're yes. going to be picked up on time to get to the doctor. So no, so it is, we do schedule their trips, say that they call in at 8, they want to be at the Longmont United Hospitals by 9 a.m. We do schedule their trip. There is a 30 minute window. So we do say your pickup will from home will be from 8 to 8.30 to get them there by 9. And then we schedule the return trip back home. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they do have a guarantee, right? It's just, it, you know, with the so many clientele that we have. So we do have some like, oh, we can get you there, but you can call back and see if we can get you back home. So it just really depends on the availability that we have. But we do right now, we are registering a lot of clients basically in the Boulder County area. I guess I, I need clarification. Yeah. When you say uh, registering people, so people have to be on the list in order to be. Yeah, you have to be registered in order to receive a training. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if our registration takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, we ask basic information like if they have a disability. Um, yearly income because that's what they go off of their reduced fare. So reduced fare is three dollars one way and three dollars back if they fall in that guideline. And if they're wanting to go to Boulder, it would be six dollars one way and six dollars back. Yeah. Is that a one-time registration? Yes, one-time registration. Now let's say that they don't use our service within a year. They will go unactive in our system, but they can always call. We look up their name and reactivate them again. But if that's only if they don't use the service within the year. But their name still stays in our system, but they're just unactive because they haven't used their the service. Are those standard rates? Um, you don't 
consider income level of the, the client or anything like that? It's just a flat rate, is that right? It's just a flat rate um, for the full fare, the $6, and then the reduced fare is, um, you know, the $3. Now let's say that they're visually impaired. We do have a funding for that where they do not have to pay. So like if they're visually impaired where they cannot see at all, <coughs> there is a, um, we do have that funding where we can give them their trips for free. And we're there, so we're never going to deny a person a trip if they don't have the fare cost. They still can take the trip, but we just let them know you know your fare is three dollars or your fare is six dollars. But we do not, um, what is it? We don't, we do not deny trips if they don't have their, their fare cost for that trip that day or the next couple of days. But we will bring it to their attention, you know. And I know there is, we do have a lot of clients that call in and say, you know, I have no income. Um, so, and it's very hard because we have to, you know, with, you know, provide that fair cost for them. Now you say everything needs to be scheduled. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you have a, can you respond to a circumstance where a person's in an emergency or something? Yes, for an example, this morning we, um, I had a call, this gentleman was rushed to the ear emergency room yesterday and he has an electric wheelchair. Um, he wanted to have us pick up his electric wheelchair from home and take it to the hospital. Right now he's at say, uh, Good Samaritan in Lafayette. So we did schedule the trip, um, got um, to get his wheelchair to him. And now that somebody's really sick needs to be taken in, we will try to find a way to squeeze them in, you know, to get, just depending how full our routes are. <coughs> but sometimes we do have that availability where we can do it the same day emergency room or emergency we do have where you can book from one to seven days in advance so if they call in today at eight o'clock and they want to go to um, king supers at nine we can get them there today if the availability is open for the same day but for emergencies like today with the wheelchair you know we did get that trip set up for him and got from his wheelchair to his to the hospital <laughs> I understand how crazy it must be <clears throat> to schedule what you do. Yeah. You know, all the trips and all the rides and all the requests. Personally, I recently had a neighbor okay. who um, is on um, Walker and she needed to go to her ortho. And she called at the beginning of the week, it was last week I think, and she could not get a ride for Thursday. She called back on Wednesday and they were able to give her a ride Thursday morning, but there was no guarantee when she was coming back. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening was she got to the ortho like three hours early and then hung out there and then they picked her up like two hours after her appointment and brought her back. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at that, I mean, she got to do it. She got to go and she got a ride, so that's a good thing. I'm, I'm assuming you're taking measures to improve that in the future. Can you tell us what measures are being taken or what plan is being made to keep that to a more reasonable window where somebody doesn't have to call on a Monday and find out Thursday is already booked, yeah. call back on Wednesday and find out they can get picked up at 9.30 for a noon appointment and get back to the to the yeah. place at three o'clock. It's very hard to tell. Um, Cause say, like an example, today's Wednesday, we're scheduling for the following Wednesday. So we always recommend that they call within that week in advance saying that they know they have that appointment for next Wednesday. <clears throat> I know it's hard because we always say one to seven days, um, but we're hoping to improve by, you know, expanding and growing more. With VIA, you know, it's just the thing is with the funding is what really, you know, for us to get those more drivers, to get more, you know, to get on time. But with the new software system that we have, because we used to have an old software system where we were getting the trips, but it was like kicking people out when we were booking the trips, so we would have to go in and fix all that. And some people were just like, what's going on with the new software? We do that 30 minute window. Um, but the thing is, it's very hard to tell with the, since we are a shared ridership with money to buy and tell. So it is like, you know, we can get you there, but we can't get you there at the time you're wanting. And we always ask that they call back to continue to check to see if somebody canceled, because we do have cancellation throughout the day. 
Um, we do have people that call in and say, no, I want to cancel my trip and schedule it for the next day. So we do have those clients that call in and switch their times or cancel. So we just ask that they keep calling to see if we can get them speeds in at that time that they need to. It's, it's just very hard because VIA is getting busy, <laughs> very busy. And so we're hoping, like, you know, with um, my the operations manager, you know, we're just, just like, we're hoping to get all that where we can add more so we can get more time in where everyone needs to be at what time. I, oh. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I live in a um, village on Main Street, and since I've been there, I've heard the problems people have had, and I've been there for years. Um, getting to appointments and not getting picked up, um, not knowing what time they were going to get picked up from the apartment, not knowing what time they were going to get picked up from the appointment, um, just the unreliability of the and. What I again will say is, are you making plans for the future to what's being done yeah. to continue to improve that? Yeah, so I can most definitely bring that up today because we do have a mobility meeting and I'll bring that up to them in the meeting. But I know we do send out reminder calls. We send out reminder calls the night of the trip and then we send out reminder calls the day of the trip when the clients are going to be picked up. Now let's say that the client called in and scheduled a trip to get to their appointment, but we couldn't find them on getting back. We put it on a denial list. So we let them know we only found you one getting there, but can you please call back and check to see if the availability is open. So I know some of our clients do forget. They think they have the round trip, and then they call back and they're like, where's my ride? So sometimes we can get them that trip back home, but if they only have one way, we take them there. But we always tell them to please call back to check because we can get them there. Or for an example, we can pick them up in the medical appointment, but we can't get them there. So that's why we always ask that they call back. And we do have that go-go system that goes out, I believe, 5, 30 or 6 at night. Sometimes it just depends. Um, and our robo system is not perfect. You know, it, sometimes it does send out the calls. And, you know, IT has worked on that where we tell them we need this, this person didn't get the call, so they'll go in and check and they're like, yes, the call went out that this time, and then they'll let us know what time the call went out, we'll let our clients know, well, the client, you know, the call went out, and then they're like, okay, you know, maybe I missed it. But we do send out those reminders letting them know about their trips as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, you're welcome. With all the expansion that you're doing, mm -hmm. what's your capacity in Walmart for the ridership? Right now, they have not told us what our capacity is at. So like an example, Denver, right now we have over 1,300 people that we have on our wait list. And so, so today or? Um, just through the whole year. So like what it is, is like the funding that we have for Denver, you know, right now at Denver it's very hard to get funding. Um, so right now for them, we have over 1,300 people on the wait list, which we do follow back and call back and say, hey, we don't have the capacity, we still want to remain on the wait list to see if we're going to get that, that funding. That, that's a wait list to register for certain? Yeah, that's only for Denver County, but for Boulder County right now, we don't have a capacity. Um, we're still registering because we do have volunteers that go in and volunteer a couple of days out of the week to help us out get clients where they need to go as well. Mm -hmm. We use personal transportation or the volunteers? They use our vehicles. Okay. Yeah, and then we also have uh, friends and family reimbursement. So say that an example that we can get them to their appointment, but we can't bring them back home. So like, okay, then my, my friend pick me up or take me or anything, we do a mile of reimbursement. So we do have that as well for clients that like say that they wanted to use that friends and family, but we can take them and just do the friends and family for that. We do have that as well as an option. Yeah. How do you ever know? Well, so when we register them, we actually send them. So we either do email or we mail out the information. So the clients that we register, we send it out in an email. Like we let them know about our friends and families as well as with the intake forms. And then when we mail, we mail out a, a little card that says friends and family reimbursement as well. Which one? This is the one I have right here. So this is what it looks like. And we have those flyers here yeah. too. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, when they register, we let them, we give them all that information when we register them as well. So it really should, it should be a rare time when someone can't be picked up unless they have no family or friends. We um, don't know about the program. Yeah. Yeah, we can let them know, like say, so for mobility, when the registrationists get a call and they're like, I'm transferring your work client because we only found it one way and they want us to other options. So we do have, I didn't bring that paper with me, but we do have other options for the Boulder County Transportation. So one of them is Boulder Creek. We have Flex Ride. Um, RTD, I think, is one of the options we give them. And then C Troops. We give them other options and then we also let them know, like we can go in there and look at their profile and say, we do have a friends and family reimbursement program that you can sign up for as well. And then they'll let us know right then and there if they want it or if they do not want it. It's like, <clears throat> I assume you have a contract. Yes. As a, but I don't know who the contract is with. Is it with Boulder County? The city, the city? of Longmont Human Services. Yeah, right. And I've got a, a follow-up question. I'm sorry, I was a, a, little, okay. um, a little late. I'm Christina. Um, I work with the Senior Services team. I'm the Department yeah. Director for Human Services. Um, and uh, we have, one of the programs in our department is we have clinicians that are um, that are housed at some of our permanent supported housing, uh, at one of our permanent supported housing um, uh, locations at the suites where there's a large number of, yeah. of seniors. One of the barriers that our clinicians have encountered in getting people to and from um, uh, what we're considering kind of medically necessary um, appointments yeah. are um, around substance uh, use uh, groups, um, um, AA uh, counseling, um, they were told that that isn't considered medically necessary. And so I'm wondering if that's something <coughs> that your leadership could consider or I'm planning on reaching so out I'm, to. I'm, what I'm thinking it is, so if a client has Medicaid, um, mm -hmm. they have to go through TransDev. We can provide their personal trips like such as grocery store, um, pick up a prescription or their glasses, or like going to visit a family member mm -hmm. or a friend. But if they do not have Medicaid, we can provide them those trips. It's only if they have Medicaid, they have to go through TransDev. It's just a shared contract we've had with them since we have started. And it's trans? TransDev, so it used to be okay. called Intelleride. Okay, yeah. perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you for answering all these no, difficult yeah. questions. I really appreciate yeah, because there's some clients that call in and they're like, no, you know, and I was like, well, it does show on your profile. So when we register, we always ask if they have um, Medicaid. Okay. So like that, we let them know before, like, heads up, hey, you know, if you have Medicaid, we can only do your personal trips, but anything medical has to go through TransDev. But if they do not have Medicaid, we can do medical and um, all that kind of stuff. Okay, then. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, Sam. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, for instance, Gwenda Lafayette, Gwenda Lewis, uh -huh. we're going to Boulder. Do you just go on certain days? Certain days. So, so if I needed to get to Boulder on a Wednesday, Longmont? you might not yeah. go on So Monday. Longmont to Boulder is Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Now Longmont to Louisville, Lafayette, Erie, so here that's only on Tuesdays. Yeah, so there is certain days, but Longmont with the Longmont is always Monday through Friday. And if they live in Boulder, it's the same thing. It's like coming to Longmont, it would be Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So the Boulder is always Monday through Friday. And then the same thing to Louisville, Lafayette, Superior from Boulder is Wednesdays and Fridays. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of confusing. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so we, it is certain days that we do go out to Boulder from Longmont. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we might, yeah, no, you're very welcome. So you're always looking for volunteers to try? To that's right, that is correct. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So when we do our outreach events or our presentations, we do let them know we do have volunteer drivers that we're looking for. Um, you know, you can set up the days you want, the schedule, like okay. it has to be Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. So you can pick your times if you want part-time or full-time. So yeah, so any volunteer drivers that you know of, we, we need some. <laughs> 
But other than that, that, do, yeah. you have, do you need any special license for the volunteer CD, CDL or just regular So, with the volunteers, or? they do use our company vehicle, so they would have to take a training class at FIA. Um, so, they do have to do the driving, but um, as long as you have your driver's license. But if you're doing like a bus or anything like that, I believe you do have to have the, the CDL. So I just want to sort of piggyback on what Lonnie said yeah. because I have dealt with seniors at several of the other facilities and that's the same thing that I'm hearing yeah. is that yes I can get to an appointment it might be you know early or it might even be late which causes a problem at the doctor's office um, and then a lot of times they're left sitting there after the office is closed waiting for a ride so how do we you know that that needs to be fixed because yeah. I've seen them even sitting out here in front of the senior center waiting for a ride that you know they've been sitting out there for half an hour, 45 minutes. So how do we uh, make that better for them? Because otherwise they're not going to go and I hate to see them yeah. not go to something when it's just that. And I've been on the receiving end of that where I had a ride to Boulder but coming back even though they knew what time, I still was an hour wait. Yeah. yeah, I will most definitely bring that up because I don't want to give you the wrong answer for that one, but I will bring it up in our meeting today that we're going to have, um, letting them know the issues that we're having. I mean, I get those phone calls of mobility as well, you know, and it's very hard to tell them, like, I'm sorry, you, you know, like, it, it's very hard to tell clients, and then some of our clients get really upset with us. I noticed mm -hmm. a lot, too, mm -hmm. with our clients, um, we do also have a 30-minute window. For the pickup so say that they're here at the senior center and their pickup starts from 2 to 2 30 so it could be anywhere for the driver can really get here at 2 or 2 30. Mm -hmm. so i know that that is one thing too because some do forget that they have that 30 minute window but i would most definitely bring it up in our meeting today and let them know the issues that we're having you know clients only get one way or they have to wait two hours you know go to the appointment early when the appointment's not till 12. So yeah, I will most definitely bring that up because I don't want to give you the wrong answer. You're like, you know, but I will definitely bring that up in the meeting today. Where do you get your funding people? So I know we get it through um, we get it through grants through the county side, but I'm not quite sure which ones we get it from. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. The funding where we get our funding from. Mm -hmm. So I know it's through grants and the, uh, the county, but I'm not sure like which. Department we get the funding from agency. Yeah, agency. agency. The city agency. of Longmont also funds yeah. a pretty good amount. Yeah. Because because both, both the city of Longmont, the city of Longmont, the city of Longmont. Yeah. 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 It boils down to not enough funding, yeah. which means that the agency needs more funding, other resourceful funding, yeah. so you guys can provide more of the stuff that yeah. you're falling behind, and we can't or can't provide it because of the funding. So yeah. Funding is needed, I yeah. guess. So that's it. So, and to Peggy back on her point, do you feel just personally that the demand is greater than your resources? That's a good question. <laughs> like for our clients, the demand is what they need. Mm -hmm. I honestly well, to address some of the concerns yeah. that Lonnie and uh, no, I, it's a it's a big. It's a very, I mean, like I said, I get those phone calls and it's it's very hard to find, you know, like they only give it one way and I wish I could personally help them and be like, well, let me go pick you up, you know, but I can't do that. And it's very hard. It's very hard and, you know, it it is hard for our seniors that do dialysis, that do um, radiation for cancer, and, you know, and that's very hard because I personally, my grandmother passed away from cancer and hearing them say like this is very important like i only got it one way but i can't get away back home mm -hmm. you know so that is that does concern me a lot personally but um you know it goes based off of like how our funding works and everything like that because not only like our funding we have to ha hire like more drivers to get more you know fund to get our clients to where they need to go as well it sounds like the demand is there. Yeah, yeah. most definitely. And I know in the Hispanic population, have, you know, sometimes they're you know, intimidated, they feel shy, mm -hmm. they don't, you know, no, 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 no,
there are backups, like friends yeah. or whatever, that they need to know, or you have a list of people. And if anybody can get there, they don't know they pueden regresar, sí. and turn them back. So we need to have that list to, to know. Yeah, we have that list to provide them to as well. And if there's out there, you know, yeah. within the family that you transport, you have the family or whatever, you know, we need to let them know that we are going to put them on the list for them yeah. to know. Yeah. Because there, yeah. again, to follow up on her question, are there populations you think that are underserved by your service? Populations that are underserved by their service? I, I don't believe so. I think it's just. Um, I, I, that's a hard <laughs> question. Yeah. Sense, but I mean, does, yeah. Does, does, does anything jump out? I mean, they are, is because they don't know, they don't understand, right? Right, and there is, there is the limit, understand, yeah. Because they don't know, they don't understand, they don't know how about to go about it. Yeah, so, we yeah. have a lot of, um, like, for example, Hispanic people that call in and they're just like, we never knew of your service, like, you know, and that's why we try to go to these outreach events to let people know about the service, our presentations are mm -hmm. like, anything like that with our meetings like for example like frederick de como um we do service out there as well there's a lot of clients that didn't know of our service but it's like we, we go out there and do our outreach and there's a lot of hispanics as well that like oh i didn't know my dad needs to get to dialysis you know can you get him registered and let them know everything about our service and some of them even cry because they're like i never knew you know that there's services out there that would help you know clients like us if I can speak okay. to that outreach piece mm -hmm. real quick. We do have via come do programs here yeah. both in Spanish and in English. Mm -hmm. Our resource specialists tell folks about via, the front desk tells folks about yeah. via. There's a section about transportation in the resource um, guide and the catalog. So we try to help get yeah. the word out. Yeah, no, I know there's a lot of agencies that do, but the, I just, I honestly feel like they've heard of it, but they don't know exactly what we do or how we operate. So it's like, um, you know, some clients in Brighton, oh, I got your services through um, the senior center out in Brighton and they're bilingual. And I'm like, okay, well, great. And they're like, I always see people come and go on the bus, but I never knew what exactly it was. But I was like, okay. So we do have services that, you know, let our community know and let other clients know this is what we do. But they're just not sure or like they're too shy or they don't know like exactly what it is all about. Lottie. This idea just popped into my head. Do places that receive um, clients from the buses, you know, that they bring bus, bring the clients to by bus, also have information on VIA? Um, places like dialysis, you yes. know, things and like that. And some of our Do drivers they? have those flyers as well. Okay. Our drivers have, like, say that we got, um, Right now, the Kono and Frederick and Fire, so we got an extra bus, but that may end in December, I believe, not unless we get the funding to keep that extra driver out there. Okay. So, like, we have our, our drivers drop off flyers at uh, the senior center, rec center, or when we do our outreach events, our, our presentations, we leave flyers there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, we do let them know about the service. I don't know how this would be, so I'm kind of figuring out as I'm talking. But if there are places that seniors generally go to yeah. for treatment for, you know, doctors appointments or whatever, yeah. do they have or would it be a benefit for them to have information on how people can use VIA? I mean, is VIA promoted there? Is it something they can get information on from the places that they go to? Yeah. So say they, they don't know about VIA, they get rides for the first times that they use the, the um, center, the medical center, but then they're able to get information on what they can do in the future as far as get VIA rides. Yeah. So Is I that know, promoted? Yeah. So I know okay. how some of our clients that go to the dialysis center in Longmont, they have, you know, the dialysis people let them know, hey, you know VIA. Because we do have okay. clients that sometimes just want to jump on the bus, but they're not registered. Right. And then they call and they get them registered right away, and then like, and we let them know about all our information as well. So it is out there. I just feel like 
Um, some of them quite don't understand. Right. Yeah. So it is out there. There's a lot of information out there, even on our website as well. Right. Yeah. And then uh, and also our recreation centers have flyers posted up and everything like that. Or did I did I hear you say that those are in Spanish as well? So we just got. So we just updated these ones. Um, so we haven't received. We just got these ones in last week. So we're waiting for our Spanish reports to come in as well. But these ones are our most updated ones from the last ones. It, and then it's just more about the third cost, because I know back then it was $5, but they upped it up to $6. So, yeah, so these are, uh, we're just waiting on our Spanish brochures. Any other questions? I have one. Yes. Microtransit, any thoughts on how the you know, microtransit that you know, fires up here in Longmont. Yes. The impact that'll have on your population. Yes, so we do, we just talked about that in our operations meeting. So we are, you know, hoping that we can, I know there for a minute when it started, we had meetings with them hoping that VIA can help out with them, but they decided to go, you know, somewhere else, which is totally okay. But that's one thing we're looking for as well. So that's why we're trying to, navigate and have all these meetings to see what we can do to improve via more and then with the funding as well with micro because yeah micro transit is gonna be one of the ones that we're most like in long run. I would imagine we'll have yeah. it's gonna have impact on the demand. Yeah. Inter yeah. Inter yeah, yeah, most definitely. Mm -hmm. Brenda, did you want to say something? No, no oh, okay. sorry, I have a side comment. Apologies. Okay, any any other questions? It's been very informative. Very. And I'm sorry, I didn't even use a projector. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, that's because we're so used to like just talking and yeah. stuff using this, but I'm so sorry I didn't. Oh, well, once you get this group going, <laughs> you know, you yeah. ask questions forever. And yeah, and any questions that, that I don't answer, I, I apologize, but I will bring those up in the meeting today, most definitely, we, letting them know our concerns. Yeah. You know, and. We, yeah. We'd appreciate some feedback on that. Yeah, most definitely I'll have. Either to Ronnie probably. Yeah, or, um, I'll have Lisa or Adriana reach out to as well about those concerns or questions. Yeah, and I'll take any brochures. Yeah, yeah. so today. <laughs> I, mean, I brought 25 because I wasn't sure. Take them all. I, I will take them all. I maintain our resources yeah. closet. I will take them all. Okay, take and them. if you need take more, we can mail them out or I can bring them to you as well. Thank you. And then once I get the Spanish ones, I can bring those as well. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Thank you, Crystal. For Thank you're welcome. Thank, Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Mark, so, Martha, did you get your issues? Raised? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Um, we'll leave it up. Okay. Yeah. Just take up the. Um, okay. Yeah. We'll okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Did you guys need me for anything else? Nope. That's, okay. I think that's it. Well, thank you so much. You're very thank welcome. You. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Very <laughs> good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Going to my next meeting, so I can let them know. <laughs> we, we, we really didn't mean to put you on the hot seat. Oh, no, it's yeah. fine. It's but. very like I was telling. Um, so, my presentations that I tried was like only three people or uh -huh. like a couple people, or like sometimes I went, but it was just like so. This is like my second one by myself. Oh, so I was a reservationist, but I moved into the mobility department. It's going to be about a year. Oh. So, I was a reservationist for three years. Yeah, so I know how it's been with our uh, writers. <laughs> well, you did a good job. Yeah, you did. Thank you guys. All right, you guys have a good day. Appreciate it. So it's going to be five years, but I have left oh, okay. three years, but I came back. So now it's going to be my fourth year. But now we okay. work mobility. Do a good job. Yes, thank you guys. All right. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, can we go through the old business first, Absolutely. or do you want to move into yours first? No, I just have to leave here about 11.40. 1140. Uh, 11.40, did yeah. you say? Yeah. Yes, and I have to leave in about 10. Did you want me oh, to? Okay. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll leave that then. Let's let's just go ahead. Here. Oh, sure, sure, sure. sure. Did you, I, you, I, go, you, you have something to go first? You have to leave. So, so, when did you say? Yeah, I have to leave in about 10 minutes. And if you had asked if I could talk about trends here around mental health. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, let's see, why don't you go, let's see. Why don't you go first then? Okay. 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 Let, 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 let me introduce this first. Uh, um, mental health is a big deal. 
And I just read some information yesterday. I was amazed. It was a, in the ICMA uh, um, data. And they said over the last few years, the mental health uh, reports of need for services has increased 33%. Can you believe that? 33%? And it's just, it's just gotten. It's really yeah. boomed, so to speak. Dave anyway. asked us to kind of give an overview of what the city is doing and if we have any mental health uh, investments. And I, my apologies, Dave, I had your the presentation that I was going to send to you and Ronnie in draft, and I never sent it, so um, oh. I will follow up. Oh, okay. I meant to send it to you last Friday, so didn't do that. So Randy's going to talk about Trends here, Trends here and then I'll do yeah. more of it over okay. quickly. All right. Um, so if you're not aware, uh, we have counseling available through the Senior Center in kind of a number of forms. Um, we have a peer support program. John is one of our peer support volunteers. Um, for folks who don't have a diagnosable, very high level kind of mental health issue, who just need <coughs> some support, that program provides support from another older adult um, to just give really a hand through normal aging issues, brief struggles with folks, families, kind of what I would call the low hanging fruit with mental health struggles that we all share as human beings. Um, that program is really successful and our peer support volunteers are also able to help people through a number of support groups here at the Senior Center. And they have started leading classes this year with um, Kaylee Schoenbeck, our licensed clinical social worker who does counseling here on our team as well. The trends around what we see here, um, some of you have heard this, so apologies, but I don't think everyone has. We had a lot of folks who declined getting mental health treatment during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. They wanted to see somebody face to face. They really did not want to take us up on the options of getting service over the phone or over a program like Doxy on the computer, which was kind of like Zoom but HIPAA compliant for privacy, uh, so they waited. <laughs> so we had a huge influx of folks getting counseling the last few years here at the Senior Center. And what we have seen in 2024 is that that has finally leveled off, which is a relief, um, I think, for everyone involved, <laughs> that folks are feeling sort of more settled in general. Um, so we're seeing the, the trend of need be more what it was like before the pandemic. So for instance, sometimes our clinical staff, myself, and I have a very small caseload now that I supervise some of the staff, um, but Kaylee has more of a normal caseload. We sometimes have a wait list, sometimes we don't. That was normal before the pandemic. We had had a solid, nonstop, unmanageable kind of wait list from 2021 when we reopened until early this year. So that has, that has quieted down. Right now we have a wait list, but there's only four people on it, um, which is pretty manageable. Whenever somebody does come to us for counseling and either we have a wait list or we feel like we're not the right specialist to help them, or if they're not actually asking us for counseling, they're actually just trying to find a practitioner in the community who takes Medicare which a lot of people call for help with because it's really hard to figure that out on your own online. We keep a list of referrals. We have a handout version of this and kind of a clinician version of this where we keep our own notes, um, where we've got folks who will see people privately in their homes, um, see people privately online, although I got to tell you still, a lot of people don't want that option. <laughs> um, and we, we just have this available for folks. We have some specialist information we keep around, are you a veteran? Are you struggling with cognitive impairment? Are you struggling with substance abuse to be able to get more specialized treatment? Um, so there is no one on our wait list who has not also been offered these other resources. And we do have quite a few people who contact us just to get those resources and they're gone. Sometimes too, when we follow up with folks who have been on our wait list, once we get through the list and we're to them, they have already gotten that help somewhere else. Yeah. So that, again, feels pretty manageable right now. The trends about what bring people in are very consistent over time. The top five reasons people tend to come in. Number one is grief around people in their life dying and especially friends, siblings, right? When you, when you outlive the people you love, 
getting into older age can feel like a struggle around grief. <coughs> Loneliness, general losses, different kinds of losses, um, adjusting to major life changes, which could be retirement, physical changes, health changes, becoming a family caregiver, and then conflict with family. Looking at the data from this year so far, what I found really interesting is that all of that stays true. It's pretty much the same, but anxiety levels have actually gone down, which I would not have assumed in an election year. <laughs> Usually in election years, actually, we see a huge spike. In <laughs> but this year we've seen less. What we've seen a lot more of are folks struggling with medical issues and physical challenges. And that might just be reflective of the sort of average age of folks coming into the senior center and the likelihood of developing physical problems and challenges as we age, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it was actually really nice and relieving to see that the anxiety level has, has come down a bit. Not at all what I expected. Otherwise, we're seeing the same general needs of what are bringing people in tend to very highly be around adjusting to major life change, dealing with grief, conflict with families. Randy, will you talk about how we're addressing um, the need for uh, Spanish-speaking services? Mm. Thank you, yes. We have been working for many months. Christina has a little fund with the city that we are gonna use to hire a clinician to provide services in Spanish. And it's a, it's a limited pool, but it's something as opposed to nothing that we have to offer ourselves right now. Um, right now when folks come in who need Spanish referrals, we are connecting them with organizations like Salud, um, Central Amistad, who have counseling services in Spanish, but we haven't been able to kind of get a quick one-on-one -on -one offer to somebody. So we have a clinician, we have a contract, she's coming on the 19th to have it notarized, so we're, we're about this close to finalizing that. Um, and we are requesting, I believe, from the friends to pick that up going forward and provide a small amount of funding to just keep that contract going since we don't have a bilingual clinician. And I have on my list to transfer that money to senior services so you can just manage it. Thank you. So that is very exciting. One on one question is going to be, okay. yeah, I don't have, yeah, but just let me tell you, it hasn't gone down, it's up, especially with our country, okay? And it's really, really important. If there's anything that they can dish out and be help get the trust level also, you know? Absolutely. And we have kept a list for years of private practicing clinicians who speak Spanish as well, it's just that most people can't actually afford that. So we finally just got creative around, can we, can we hire a clinician and pay them Up ourselves? to $120 an hour for a, a bilingual therapist. Um, and so we know that our seniors just can't afford that, but still need, um, need the resource. So we've also been networking to try to find a clinician who can do a grief support group in Spanish, because there's been a need for that group work. People get a lot of group work because you get that validation that you're not the only one feeling this way, right? It's one thing to have a therapist say that to you. It's another thing to see six to 10 other people in the room who are going through the same thing. So we really like offering support groups. People get a lot out of that. And we're trying to find somebody to do a grief group in Spanish as well. So Brandy, do you have to offer Spanish for caregivers? Do you mean counseling like a group, or a group? And so there is a group called Circulo de Apoyo that started out as just a caregiving specific group and we couldn't get enough people to come to it so they expanded it to be sort of a general aging issues support group. But the person who leads that group has a lot of experience supporting caregivers and that was her original intention for the group. So she still makes that need. It's just not only for caregivers, it's got a broader scope. Our resource specialists who are bilingual, Melissa and Veronica, also provide a ton of support and resources to caregivers in Spanish. Okay. And on that note, I just, I didn't bring it and I apologize because it didn't connect in my brain. Y'all had asked months ago if we could translate our resource mm -hmm. rec card mm -hmm. to Spanish. And Veronica Garcia worked on that a lot to identify <laughs> A transcreation around language. It's not just a straight interpretation. How would you explain some of these services in Spanish? We've just gotten it printed about a couple weeks ago. So those are now in rotation. 
Um, we've got them, they've been delivered to our center, El Comite in Salud. We've got them here in the building. And they also note that folks can talk to Veronica and Melissa about getting referrals for counseling. We get to get some to the youth mm -hmm. center as well because we have a lot of multi-generational families that, mm -hmm. um, yeah, parents come in looking for resources for their kids and for their um, parents as well. Do you want those in Spanish and English? Mm -hmm. yeah, you can send them to Claudia. So that, I apologize, this is all the time I have this morning. But if anybody has more questions about sort of our specific services here, myself and Kaylee Schoenbeck, the, the sort of more functioning counselor on the team since she's got the real caseload of counseling services, would be happy to talk with you at any time. You can just schedule a time with us to talk more about what we offer. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Oh, now. A person that needs no introduction. <laughs> I don't know if that's Christina. good or bad, Dave. <laughs> oh, okay. Christina's going to talk about mental health with us. Sure. So, so David originally asked me to talk about, but his first question was, does the city have um, an interest or investment in mental health? And interestingly enough, that was one of the big areas um, that our department um, works in, not only in senior services, but um, in our clinician program through our permanent supported housing and um, of course through um, children, youth, and families and then uh, of course in the health and well-being um, focus area that we have funding through our human services um, funding program. And we can talk a little bit uh, more about that. Um, so again, just to talk a little bit more about you know, what we can cover today is what the focus on mental health looks like um, we take it from a center of excellence approach and I can talk a little bit about what we do um, there, uh, why this team is taking this on and then how we're building into larger community and, um, and county efforts I'll share with you. So um, what we know is that uh, more than 50,000 um, Americans died by suicide in 2023. That's more uh, than any year on record, um, and it, follow, it follows an overall increase of about 5% from the prior, um, from, from 2021. So we also know that in Longmont Housing Authority, um, what we uh, needed was more support for our formerly unhoused individuals um, living in permanent supportive housing. Um, we needed to support them with more robust um, services. This was critically uh, important, especially for those experiencing mental health challenges. Um, and we know that housing and homeless impacts almost every part of our city business. Um, as I thought about it, there really isn't any area that isn't impacted um, by, by housing and, and homelessness. Um, we also know that Longmont has changed. Uh, I started working in Longmont in 1999. Um, and it very much so had a, a very, very small town feel. We're now over 100,000 population, um, and so we're quickly becoming a, a large city. There's still that little hometown feeling, but um, it's really changed. Um, it's changed even pre-pandemic. So part of what our uh, city manager's philosophy on us working together in different departments, part of the philosophy that he has um, is working from a, a center of excellence model. And what that means is that it, he's really asking us to align um, our purpose and our, and our vision around the work that we're doing in each of our departments. And really the, the bigger picture to, the, to that is that it helps fill the, the service gaps that we have. So uh, there's also other reasons outside of Longmont that we want to create a mental health center of excellence. Um, we know that, um, that we are facing unprecedented staffing and uh, economic pressures um, in the wake of the pandemic. And so Randy very eloquently talked about um, the trends that 
we have seen uh, and the needs that, that we have. We didn't previously have um, any Spanish speaking support for um, our senior uh, community here uh, in terms of, of mental health. And so we knew that was a gap and we needed to try to figure out how to, how to fill that gap. Um, Colorado ranks about 45th nationally when it comes to access to behavioral health care. So uh, Boulder County, of course, fares a little better. Um, I have a link um, to uh, uh, a dashboard, um, to a state dashboard that really gives an overview of what that health professional shortage looks like, both from, um, uh, from that, that mental health uh, piece of things, you can kind of narrow it down to, um, to uh, county level or community level data. We know that uh, bilingual and bicultural service providers um, are, um, are hard to come by and those that have the specific practice areas. So those who, um, who, uh, who work well with seniors, who have developed that part of their practice, we know that, that we're lacking there. Um, we also know that without a place to support long-term behavioral health patients um, out of the hospital, what we see is that people won't get better. Their crisis will continue, um, and they'll probably end up back in the hospital, and that's not what we want. We want people to um, be in the community, to recover in the community, and to really thrive in the community. Um, so back to talk about a little bit more of our Mental Health Center of Excellence framework. What this is, is it's a team that builds um, along, uh, builds up, uh, specialized expertise in different areas. So if you think about um, how hospitals work, if, if um, you've ever been in the hospital, you have, uh, you have people with different, um, different specializations that really kind of wrap around you and work uh, with you to get better. You may have a respiratory therapist, you may have a physical therapist, you also have um, maybe an internist, um, uh, and all sorts of uh, diff people with different backgrounds that really come around you to, to help you get better, right? And so that's the take that we um, have, uh, have put into place for this, specific, um, for this specific area as well. So we want to bring together people in our organization um, that have different skills, different knowledge, uh, and really uh, promote that consistency, efficiency, and excellence across all areas. And what we want to do is centralize that um, so that people get the best care um, that they can get. Uh, the, our primary pur purpose of a center of excellence is to uh, optimize essential processes and serve as a collaborative as a collaborative hub. We want to look at best practices and benchmarks uh, for performance and really tackle um, mental health in this case and really uh, foster that um, continuous improvement. How can we not only tackle this but continue to be better? So our team uh, within the Center of Excellence brings all of their expertise and instead of working in different silos in um, children within families and senior services in public safety where we have mental health services instead of working in silos we come together as a team and say, okay, how can we leverage what we're doing um, to make the biggest impact um, on, this, on this issue? Um, it really acts as a go-to for, um, for leadership um, so that they know kind of where we're heading, what's needed, um, and the rest of the organization can also access um, access and learn uh, from these, these experts. So whether it's issues in the library or the museum or any of our rec centers, we have this center of excellence um, that is comprised of mental health providers where people can go um, to get that, that um, information. <coughs> so again, we talked about housing and homelessness, um, but it is, uh, oh, this is a duplicate. Oh, apologies, okay. Um, we know that uh, with, men it, with uh, mental health, there's an increase in the acuity, in the, in the severeness. Um, we need to support formerly unhoused. We need to do that with teamwork. Um, and really, at the end of the day, it's part of our work plan and, our, and part of our directive um, from city council, from our, our city manager. 
Um, we know that we have the solutions um, or the expertise and possibly the, the solutions. What we've seen um, as uh, uh, we move forward with this is that there was some real success um, that we learned from in our neighborhood impact work. And so we have a neighborhood impact team um, where if there are issues in a specific park, um, we come together. That's out of the, the um, um, community and neighborhood resources department. Um, they will um, help us address issues in parks and they do that by bringing people from different departments to come together to solve those issues. So we've worked with Lanyon Park. Um, I think we've done some work in Centennial Park as we see things kind of get difficult in some areas of the city, this team comes together. And so we really learned from that model and, um, and thought that it would be a good idea to kind of implement that same model um, with regards to mental health. So what we have, um, as, I, as I said, we have clinicians, mental health services in children, youth, and families um, in housing and community wellness. So that's our, our clinician program, that's the newest one. We also have um, clinicians and, and mental health supports and public safety. Um, and then of course here in senior services. And so what we have done is come together um, to figure out how it is we can leverage um, our uh, expertise a little better. Um, and then once we have that figured out, there's also um, the Boulder County Behavioral Health Roadmap where this work is happening on a larger level. So this is driven by the county. Um, and uh, what that looks like, they did, I don't know how many of hundreds of, of focus um, groups, different um, ages, uh, different demographics across the, the board. Um, and what they've done is to uh, look at creating this behavioral health roadmap. How can we create now a county structure that is going to best um, address and meet the needs um, in this specific area. Um, the other piece that fits into this is that there was um, part of the reason I think that there was um, uh, kind of some restructure that happened to our department is because we knew that these were some really big issues um, that we needed to, to confront prior to let's see, two years ago, three years ago, our community services department was comprised of seven different divisions. Um, we had children, youth and families, senior services, recreation, museum, library, and community, community and neighborhood resources, and um, housing. They were all under one department. And so you can imagine all of the things um, that needed to be focused on there. Um, I think it was really hard to do that. And so through this restructure, what Harold and the leadership team did was really parse that out. We have recreation and culture, which we have um, recreation and um, the museum and library in one department. We have community neighborhood resources in another department. Um, and then our department is senior services, like uh, senior services, children, youth and families, um, and uh, our, our funding program um, that, that funds nonprofits as well as the, the work that we do with our, our unhoused population. Um, the other piece that they uh, implemented was that um, our human services department director now needs to be a licensed mental health professional um, because of the importance that we place in this area. And so my background is in clinical counseling. And so I've been licensed since 1997 um, and provided uh, um, individual family group counseling and then really moved into the supervision um, piece of that. And so when you look at um, the importance and, and kind of where the city goes with that, um, the city does realize that this is a big issue. Like it's one of the root causes for a lot of uh, the issues that we see um, mm -hmm. in, in our community. Um, more on the behavioral count, the Boulder County Behavioral Health Roadmap, kind of that bigger plan. Um, it's a shared vision where people can get the right um, mental health supports at the right time. 
Um, like I said, it was developed through a highly collaborative manner um, with more than uh, 600 community stakeholders and, and uh, focus groups that happened. The goals and strategies and solutions uh, are really shared um, and we want to move the county collectively um, um, to this. Um, I serve on the um, Executive Advisory Board, and it's really comprised of uh, leaders across, across the county. So we have the Community Services Director from the county. We have um, uh, Clinica Family Health and Wellness um, Director. Um, we have uh, many kind of executive leadership um, that is on that board. And then I also provided kind of a link to that uh, overall framework. If you want to read a little bit more into that, um, that link will be here in this PowerPoint. And then finally, you know me and any questions. I understand the senior services end of it. Um, can you explain public safety a little bit? How do they deal with that? Do they send it to somebody or do they actually have people involved that can handle that? A little bit of both. So what they have um, um, is, uh, it's the LEAD program, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. So what they have is um, when there is a call where there might be a mental health nexus to that call, a clinician will go out with an officer who is trained in um, uh, kind of this mental health model. They will go out to provide that intervention. Um, and so the goal is not to arrest the person, but it is really to help them um, navigate the mental health piece of things um, and, and get them connected to resources. So is it your dispatch person? So the first call would probably come in there. So is it your dispatch person then that determines that this may need a lead person to go? Okay, that's pretty heavy. It, it is pretty heavy, yeah. Wow. It is pretty heavy in these clinicians. They wear bulletproof vests. They, um, they go out with officers um, mm -hmm. to do that. Lonnie and Amy. My one thought as you were going through things was it was it was really good to see that we are getting away from leaving everything up to the police. Mm -hmm. Where they're the only ones that respond mm -hmm. and they have to, you know, decide what to do and all of that. Mm -hmm. Um we've seen it nationally where people are saying, you know, they should have clinicians that go out with police now when there's certain calls that mm -hmm. made. There's certain help that should be available other than a uh, um, police officer. And I think that's so important. And I kept hearing that as you were going through all the information. And it kept getting bigger. Like the thought of what you're not leaving up to the police, but bringing into the area where it should be, got bigger and bigger as I heard you speak. And I was so glad to hear that because I think that's something that you know, we all know needs to be addressed. And so I was happy to see that that's really the direction you guys are going in because I think it's going to help keep people from getting in trouble when they don't have to Absolutely. and getting the help they need when they do need it and uh, finding ways to deal with things other than ways that are going to get them in trouble. So I'm, I'm so encouraged to hear all that. I think that's fabulous. Really that's important amazing. work. And, and what we've seen, um, let's see, we've had clinicians at the suites um, since June. Um, what we have seen is a marked decrease in the number of police calls um, for kind of lead um, um, uh, engagement um, at this point. We do have people that, that um, are used to that and they continue to call but now what we have because we have built this center of excellence um, uh, team is that we have the clinicians working closely uh, with the lead program to say okay this person called we don't think that it is an emergent issue can you connect with them to make sure that they're okay and that they don't need any more and that you know hospitalization for example isn't on, on the table we don't lead with hospitalization we want people to be in the community and, and thrive um, but that has been a really good um, partnership and so we're going to mm -hmm. continue to um, 
to develop that and see how it, it, it looks um, and see what more we can do to improve that system. I think it's a good direction. And I can say that the program is really neat but because I'm part of the El Comité when it was born at the Two Hispanics. I was one of the co founders for getting into the communication, the police department. That's when she was saying, where is public safety? Police department. So, yeah, they got to get them involved and get those people to the right department where, where it's needed. And it's mm -hmm. really crucial and important. And that's how you get your community to come together and understand it. Because they're, you know, you don't want to see them in the hospital, you don't want to see them in jail. You don't want to see them where can they fix their life and go on to it and be part of the community instead of being negatively up there. John. John. I heard that the uh, here in Portland, you've got the Alberta that supports the non profits here. Mm -hmm. What's the, I heard you say on house issues also. Mm -hmm. What's happening with that? So Eliberto is the basically the, the liaison to our homeless shelters. So to um, to Hope and to All Roads, formerly Bo Boulder Boulder Shelter, and so um, he is involved in everything from policy um, to the kind of notification on the city side if there is cold weather sheltering, um, and so that's the whole second part of 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 the position that, that he, that he um, does. And so he also helps to, um, we have 12 locally controlled vouchers that the city funds, um, housing vouchers. And so he is part of the group that vets people um, to get them placed in, into those vouchers as they become open. And so he has um, a lot of, uh, he does a lot of work um, with that with our his job is 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 huge, just yeah. like you know Ronnie and, so, and Phil does. Yeah, there's lots of lots of moving pieces, and very few people in our our department. So, yeah. Any other questions? I just want to make a comment. Is that uh, in a long run, I think we're really blessed with the community that we have. I tell you, we have a lot of great. Do you speak up, Bart? Uh, I, I said we have a lot of great things in this community for the people. And I can tell you that I came, I came to Longmont about 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, they were lacking in a lot of areas, especially some of these things you're talking about as far as uh, uh, the services that are available. And the other thing is, as I look at some of the things that are going on even here at the center with bilingual people here, bilingual on the police department, uh, <coughs> bilingual leaders, and uh, I tell you, we, you know, there's always a lot, there's always room for improvement. But I'll tell you one thing, I've known Christina for over 20 years, and I know what, we were years when I started working with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're fortunate to have her and others in this city, and I just want to say thank you to you. And I'm so glad to say, you know, Harold saying, hey, I want you leaders to get involved in this different things also. Because that's what's needed. If he doesn't come in and talk, it's not something that's done. And I learned from a good leader. I was in uh, arts middle school um, as an interventionist oh. when I first was uh, started working for the city in 1999. So 25 years ago this month. Oh. So, yeah. so I got to I got to see that. Happy anniversary! Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Really you on the 15th. Yeah. So the other thought that I had as I was, I know that part of what you all want to do is really appeal to um, Harold to give him this data, what you have learned, um, whether it's in food security, transportation, mental health. Um, part of what Randy and I were talking about, um, a, an idea that occurred to me is the other area that you may want to consider um, writing a memo to our Longmont Housing and Human Services Advisory Board. So they're the they're Eliberto's advisory board, basically, um, that vets the applications um, for nonprofit funding. Um, we fund a little over a million dollars, like 1.2, 1.3 million dollars to um, about over 50 nonprofits here at Longmont. Um, nonprofits that serve Longmont 
um, people. And so part of what you might want to do when you have decided kind of what kinds of recommendations that you would want to um, provide to city council or to Herald around the issues that you're studying, part of what you might want to consider is also writing a memo to um, the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board. This is what we've learned about seniors. This is, you know, this might be a good focus for, um, for, for funding. I think that that's something that they could take into consideration. Um, ultimately, they make recommendations for funding. They're kind of the, the board that does that for city council. Um, and then city council looks at that recommendation and, and either agrees or says, you know, we want to do something different with that funding. Aliberto and I are going to go present now, I think the second Tuesday in December, um, the funding um, recommendations that this board has for 2025. Mm -hmm. um, and then that process will start up again in June. And so I think that might align with what you all are looking at and you might be able to you know, provide some of that data to this board for 2026. So you're saying that besides us making the recommendation to Harold, and besides us doing the recommendation to City Council, we should also you could make a recommendation that. to Health and Human Services? You could consider that, yeah. Okay. You could say, we are this board, we are the Senior Services Advisory Board, this is the data that we have in food insecurity or food security, um, transportation, like whatever you decide to present to Harold and, and Council, that might be something that when, you want to consider. When would they do that? They, so we're in the process where we're um, uh, making a decision on 2025's funding. So then um, applications will open up again for nonprofits. I want to say, um, actually they're due in June, I believe. Um, I want to say that they open up March, April, maybe? And then um, June, they're due. June or July, they're due. And then we, um, the the advisory board, um, reads all of those applications, scores all of those applications, um, and then we, and then they provide um, funding recommendations and amounts um, in um, November for the following year. You have some time to, yeah. to consider that. Yeah, well, I think that's really that would be for 2026. Mm -hmm. So, would we we wouldn't fill out an application? No, right. no, okay. you but could, but you could say we make recommendations. We're the Senior right. Center Advisory Board. We know that the population is going to look like this. These are some of the issues. I, I, I think that it would kind of help um, make those connections between advisory boards. Sure. More people, you know, get, get information out to more people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with one question. I can't. Okay. I just I just can't reconcile it. Okay. And everybody knows that you know the need, the demand for uh, mental health services seems mm -hmm. to be increasing. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and from what Randy says, with the, with the current caseload, the clientele that you have, things seem to be in balance. The, the demand is roughly equal to the resources mm -hmm. that are needed. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't challenge that. I'm, I'm sure that's correct. What sticks in my mind, though, is I, I just see this huge demand need the mental health services within the community that go beyond just the senior center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking that should be part of our purview too. It doesn't have to be, you know, any recommendations we make don't have to be necessarily limited right. to the senior center. Mm -hmm. It could be just in general. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering is that something we should focus on? Um, you know, I, you know, I can give you rough numbers, and so so can you. But I don't think anybody knows for sure just how many people in our community are lost, right? So to speak, or within the Hispanic community, within the over eighty-five community, you, know, you name it. Mm -hmm. 
And so um, I know the city supports mental health efforts. So we wouldn't be doing this. But um, is that is that a direction that we should encourage? Uh, that we I know there's stigma. In, in That's the exactly what I was going to say. There's a lot of stigma to yeah. people. Um, yeah, looking for help, getting help, especially in the Latino community. Yeah. That's not something that that is our go-to. Like, I'm yeah. having issues, I'm going to go see a therapist. Like, that's not something that we easily do. Yeah. I remember 100 years ago when I was an undergraduate, <laughs> that stigma was a big problem. Mm -hmm. Here, 80, 60 years later, right. it, it's still, it's still a mm -hmm. problem. So the point I'm getting to and so I think those numbers we were talking about is affected, of course, by stigma. And particularly, I've been told, in the Hispanic community. Absolutely. So is that something that the city is thinking about? So I think a couple of things. I think you hit the nail on the head when you talk about stigma. I think that probably part of what um, we're seeing in terms of the balance that Brandy talked about is that if you look back to this slide, and you look at, at the health professional shortage in, in our specific area, we actually fare better than the rest of the state in that. And so if you look at, I'm from South Central Colorado, the uh, Hosea County, um, which is very, very um, resource, very few resources around anything. And so if you were to compare different counties, you would see that Boulder County fares better than, um, than other areas across the state. So there's there's that piece of things. And then the other piece of things is that you'll know, you'll, you'll um, with the behavioral health framework uh, or roadmap, you'll see, um, if you click on that, you'll see like the interviews that were done, the, the focus groups that were done, and you'll see some of the presenting um, um, issues that were identified. Stigma is one. Um, I know that there is a, the a lack of bilingual resources. That's another. Um, and so I think that that data will give you more to say this might be the focus. But I agree with you across the board, whether it's seniors, um, it's youth, it's uh, parents with young children, like there is that mental health of things and oftentimes it's the root cause of a lot of things um, you know housing and homelessness issues um, substance use issues um, it's that mental health component that is that root cause Bobby. do you find that well my first thought when you were talking just now is that we never grew up thinking we needed to ask for help you know we just didn't and um, and if we didn't have it within our family to talk to people and stuff, then you just kind of toughed it out and figured you'd heal it on your own. Eventually, it'll just kind of iron itself out or whatever. Do you find that younger people are more apt to ask for help? Are we growing out of that stigma age-wise? Or do you find that they have the same reaction to asking for help as, as I just said that you do? No, oh, I think that it, I think it depends on the resources that are available. And so if you look at, like for example, where I grew up, there were no mental health resources within the schools. Um, but as I said, when I worked with our at Heritage Middle School, that was my, that was what I, I, I did. So they would see you know, behavior issues or teachers would say, you know, this kid is having a really hard time at home, they should go talk to you. And so having those resources, I think, makes people more likely to look for that help. And then if you have kind of the bilingual, bicultural, if you're sitting across from somebody that looks like you and speaks your language, um, whether you're, you know, Anglo, uh, African American, Latino, um, that is also going to make a difference. And so I think it I think it depends. And there's some kids that are like totally no, I'm not I'm not crazy. I'm not going to talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. It really depends on I think where it's building the 
trust level. It's the trust. The confidence mm -hmm. that you're okay. The confidence. I think I can trust yeah. you. Uh -huh. I mean, because way back I remember we met Mark, you know, Mark and Christina. The heritage was considered, oh, a public school. I'm not going to get that. They're good teachers. It wasn't like that. No, no, no. Parents had to. Parents sent kids to school to learn, not to be babysat by, by teachers or principals or whatever, you know. And that's the trust level that kids have to the parents who are growing up. But he has grown. I mean, he's done a good job. And only for other things. Yeah. We'll be back. So, Christina, can you go back to what that number was on the suicide? And do you have a idea of a breakdown on that? Because that's Americans that died. Right. Um, so, is that a yes. breakdown? Yeah. I know that what we see. Youth and seniors and. Right. You know, that kind of, yeah. um, I don't. I can dig into that more. But what I know is that, um, you know, there is. It kind of follows the, the trend with, um, you know, it follows every other trend um, that, you know, we would see um, uh, people of color would have a higher representation. Um, we would see that LGBTQ um, individuals across the board have a higher representation when you, you talk about suicidality. Um, but let me look into that. I'll, I'll get that back to you. And then what would that number be for Colorado? Because I'm assuming that means the nation. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure the Kaiser Foundation has, um, has some good data. There's a question on the model. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand it. I, this model? I, I, I certainly understand this idea of silos. And I, mm -hmm. I just hate this the way agencies build silos around themselves. But um, uh, I forgot my point. I'll come back to it. So how we're working so prior, you know, the, the four the four really before the Mental Health Center of Excellence, we all were working in our own lane. Um, the idea is that we work together um, right. to really leverage what we can do within the city that's going to impact kind of the mental health um, uh, issues, struggles that we have, get people the right resources at the right time, and then really look at how that feeds into the county framework. Okay, I don't remember my question. Okay. Is that more of a, um, let's say Brandy has a problem with something that she needs some help with. So is this kind of a, um, like a staffing model, so you would take it to the group and they'd staff it? At some point, yeah, we will have that staffing model. Because I just hired the clinicians in June, and the, the hope is we can expand on that model and have clinicians at different LHA sites and properties. Um, but that is where we're ultimately going to get, like, do we need to have a, a monthly staffing model every other month where, you know, I have this really difficult case um, a, a multi-generational family, um, how can we um, come together to kind of find the right services that will help this, this family um, would be the intent. The other piece that we're looking at implementing that, that Ronnie is a part of is we're now going to um, have the Salesforce platform so that um, we, uh, so that children, youth, and families can track all their cases, senior services can track all their cases, um, and then we would be able to see kind of where that crossover was. Um, you know, if it's a, a family with a, a three-year-old, a 15-year-old, and then grandma also lives in the household, how can we make sure that that family gets everything they need? And we think that technology will help us track that a little better. Um, because right now it's really dependent um, on who is in that position. And so Brandy retires, I retire, Hilda retires, like we would have to start all over again and make those those connections, and that's what we don't want to have to do. Well, I, I, I certainly like the idea. I just worry that the same silos that you got now might keep people from you know, making it work. You know what I mean? Right. Well, hopefully from people that access the services, they don't see any difference. It's kind of that one door approach, right? So I'm gonna to go to um, 
Brandy to talk to her about my 94 year old mother um, and the struggles that she's having, but I also have a teenager. And so with that, Brandy in the, the system can say, okay, I'm gonna send a referral or I'm gonna connect you um, to Hilda at the Youth Center. And that it's kind of that one door approach, but as a family, I'm getting everything I need. That's the goal. Yeah. And the idea is to do this without additional staff, basically use existing resources. Absolutely, always. <laughs> <laughs> all right, other questions? Thank you all. That was really good. Thank, Thank you, you Christine. That was excellent. Well, let's see. Okay. Um, old business? Yes, old business. Uh, I started to say that um, we have our presentation to Harold coming up and with the city council, depending on what we decide. Um, we really should be getting those things in order, um, thought out as to how we're going to present them. So I'm just mentioning that. So maybe by the next meeting, we should get some, maybe an outline of the kind of things that we're thinking of. Um, because all of a sudden it's going to be February. Right. Uh, we're out of time. That's what happened last year. We kind of ran out of time. So I'm just reminding everybody. Having said that, uh, transportation, Arlene, do you have anything new? No. Uh, everybody got my got a copy of this. My report. Are there any questions? Um, Microtransit should be starting in December. I know that we had talked about having them come and talk. I think we are going to be way into next year before we have them come in by the time that they run for several months and figured out how it's working and whatnot, but basically that's where that's at. In your report, you said Longmont's working with RPD to provide bus service from Longmont to the hospital in the nation. Is there anything Anything new there, or is it? No, that just that they have gotten a contract with RTD yep. to. So what? So this is the way that I kind of vision it: is that I would sit, call Microtransit and say, "Okay, I need to get down to the RTD bus, and then the RTD bus is going to take me over to the hub, and then the hub is going to take me the bus staying over there is going to take me down to Denver, to the Union Station, then the Union Station, I'll pick up the train to the airport." So that's going to become a reality. Um, the thing that, and I think it's going to be very reasonable. Okay. The thing is going to, everybody's going to have to realize it's going to take time. You know, if you were to drive down there or you were to take the uh, shuttle down there, it would just take you right straight to the airport. This is going to be very reasonable, but it's just going to take you time to make those connections and get down there. But it's going to be available. It's coming, huh? It is, and I think it's going to be really good. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, it's going to be good. Okay, uh, housing, Bonnie. Hi. Um, they, um, the person that happened to be at our um, AAC meeting the, for the first time was actually before this meeting and not after it. So I get to present, uh, in my report, you'll see I presented two months' worth of information. But the big thing was housing was the issue at the AAC meeting. So um, this is the Boulder County Housing Guide. It is not ready for distribution yet. It's still being fine-tuned. <clears throat> but the gentleman wanted to bring it to us and show it to us. So um, it will be coming out soon as soon as it's available. Of course, we'll have it available here. I'll bring a copy to everybody <clears throat> at whatever is the next a board meeting and everybody will have an opportunity to have it. Oh, good. So um, other than that, I put a link in about the Zinnia housing, um, which is the housing that mm -hmm. um, Christina is re referring to as far as having the extra counseling and things like that, the commission there. Um, and other than that, there's really nothing, the ascent is coming up um, it's going to start construction. They really aren't committing to any dates at all. Um, and I found an article about uh, affordable home ownership program, inclusionary housing. So I put that in the report too. 
in case anybody's interested in getting more information. And that's pretty much it for housing. Mm. Can I just talk about this book a little bit? Oh, sure. Okay. So when this is available for everybody, the information in here is excellent because it breaks it down by independent living, gives you the places that are available in the county, uh, broken down by Boulder, Longmont, Netherland. Um, then it goes into assisted living, it goes into uh, long-term care, and it goes into places that are available that would be uh, market. So I think the information here is gonna be really, really good when we get it, so it's coming. Good, good. We're very happy about the, the um, update you know that the new information is really new and, and uh, it's been a while since they had the Boulder County Housing Guide mm -hmm. so they're really happy to get everything updated and, and uh, the new information out to people who need it so um, again if, as soon as we get it I'll be making it available to everybody on the board and uh, we'll take it from there. Good. John. Lonnie where is the Zinnia housing again? It's, no, the Zinnia is over near um, South Sunset and 119. Across from the uh, Subaru dealership. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's behind oh, the uh, Subaru dealership. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. okay. Next to the Between suites. the Howard, oh, yeah. Yeah. right, right next to the suites. Right. And yeah. the, um, mm -hmm. the uh, behind that is the mall. Oh, the jump right. right. Yeah. yeah. So, and they have Thank a you. huge pothole. Yeah, if you fall in. That's crazy. Really? Yeah. To get into that. That's traffic control, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John. Thank you. So the food security group, you remember Naomi Curlin did a report from the uh, Longmont Food Rescue. Met with Ronnie to move some of the thoughts that they come up there. Two things in particular. One was to Look at the establishment of a refrigerator here. But that's not going to work out for a lot of practical reasons and logistical reasons. We're now measuring or looking at the idea of having food, food tables back here on Saturdays, between 8 and 12. We always got to go back to her board and more to retailers to see if she can pick up and deliver on Friday, on Saturdays. Now, there's an issue of storage. We looked at having her come on Friday. Storage of the food became an issue. So Ronnie, she and I came <coughs> last week, and there's a window, Saturdays 8 to 12, if they only can pick up food from Whole Foods, Safeway, whatever. They don't typically have people available on Saturday, so she's looking that, that logistical issue out. If she can, there seems to be some good of a support to have it here. <coughs> 8 to 12, they bring it in, set it up, distribute, clean up, and we're done by 12. So that's that's going to the ball is back in Naomi's court to see if they can do it, uh, provide that service. She knows the food's out there. She just can't. She's not sure she can pick it up or get it here on Saturdays. Um, connected to that is we also met the and I met with the uh, development director over at the Hour Center. We had a, a bit of a tussle early on because it looked like we were encroaching on some of the issues they were involved in and settled that. But very, they really want to be helpful. They're hiring a new director of food services to see if the same, we do the same thing here from 8 to 12 on Saturdays with their support. So that, that that's going to wait until they can do food services director to see if they can do it. Mm. There's a lot of support for helping seniors, involving seniors or whatever. Um, in talking with Lonnie, some of the communication issues to get the word out. Um, come back to Lonnie's discussion about how we might get the word out to all communities. We'll talk about that in a second. But the real support for getting support for seniors and food, food insecurity issues. The other issue is we went out and we met with the community neighborhood group back in August, trying to find out where we might address issues of food insecurity. And there's a lot of information available that came back to me with the staff and with the year old. <coughs> they got a map. I don't know if you get a chance to A couple maps were available. <coughs> Christina, I'm glad you're leaving because I'm talking really oh, nice oh, about oh. your group. Oh, so okay. I'm going to be here embarrassing you. Really. Oh, it's upside down. Good group. Good they are a great group. So anyway, we get these, these maps to try and identify okay. where issues of food and security are located. Okay. Thank Texas. you. And 
The maps show us that. So maps show a lot of different things, but there's not enough information yet. Mm -hmm. um, for example, they'll show us where there are food deserts, where people have trouble getting food, where there are major shopping areas, as a Circle K or what have you. We can see where there are you can see where there are areas where there are certain income levels that are affected. Okay. But the city map stops the lowest income level they have is thirty-five thousand. That doesn't address poverty levels in other parts of the city. We can see where there are people of sixty-five and over, <clears throat> but it doesn't tell us where people of fifty-five and over are living. It's out there. We just couldn't find where. So with Christina's help, come back to that in a second. There seems to be some other maps available to us. The one that we have here is again really wonderful, but it's not doesn't give us the broad enough picture of the people we're trying to serve. Seniors in the Latino community, multi-generational families, uh, people affected by income uh, shortages, whatever. That seems to be available. Christine is going to help with that. Her group is going to help with that. So all told, it's pretty interesting to see. There's also a larger map that we want to see we might put up here. Hmm. So people can identify where they live. We don't know where they live and they're coming here for, for meals on wheels. We're going to assume there's some shortage of food and we're having support. That's something we can address with these other maps. So all in all, it's moving, you'll find this to be a surprise, slowly, <laughs> but surely. Mm -hmm. The last meeting we had um, was the most amazing meeting and it goes to the point you made, Art. It's an amazing city with amazing resources. I'm surprised they get as much done with the resources they don't have. Um, but the, we met with Christina, Ronnie, Hilda, and Alberto in the Human Services Department. And they're an amazing group of people. And their commitment to this city and the people here is amazing. Um, we'll let Arlene talk about the specifics of the meeting. But the end of the meeting was there's a real connection between youth services, Alberto's group, and the senior center to get information out to people that are seniors not served and sort of back into multi-generational families and wow. back into other not served groups here in the city through the senior center and through food and security. So, I mean. Basically, John's covered um, a lot. I think that one of the things that was, and, and you brought this up about silos, um, the fact that we were able to meet with the different sections in the uh, city brought us together with okay youth and family services I think there's a way that we can communicate through them to get to the seniors when I when we get our food and food distribution site going that they will you know the kids will take notes home I'll take notes home they know where their grandparents are at if they're living with them they're living next door they know what's going on so that's one way that we're going to be able I think to do a communication that way um, Ellie Berto Talk to us about right now, as far as grants go, they have about 175,000 that they have given out to grants that work with food. So for instance, you would have WIC, um, you would have the Angel Heart, um, you know, those type of places that provide food. Then it goes, yes, to people, not just seniors, but it goes to other people as well. And those are the kind of things that we need to know, and Christina mentioned it as well. We need to find out what is out there what's available and get our foot in the door as far as, as the seniors go. But we don't want to forget that the senior is probably living with a family. And so that family is, we mm -hmm. need to incorporate them somehow in there as well. Um, and then the maps that I, I held up. The, so I think the, the interesting thing about this map is that the really dark areas are showing you the senior population. And, mm -hmm. and like John said, it does only, Right now it's only 65 and over, so we've asked for, can we get it from 55 up? But you can see the parts of the city where, where this is at. And if we provide a, a site at the senior center, we're hitting a lot of that. You know, and we, we're looking at other sites as well. So those are things that we're, we're looking at right now. Um, and I'm hoping we get that big map, because that big map shows the um, areas that, okay. So this area here is Ward 3, this area down here is Ward 2, this area over here is Ward 1. So you can kind of see, those are, we get the bigger map, it's going to be better delineated for everybody. But that's kind of where we're at right now. 
Well, ultimately, having the ward maps gives us specific council members to go back and speak to. Mm-hmm. Once we've identified the area, once we've decided where the food insecurities are, we can hone in on specific support from specific council members. And that's all that takes us back to the city manager, ultimately back to the city council. Mm-hmm. So, moving slowly, very slowly, but steadily. <laughs> Welcome to government. Sure. <laughs> yeah, really. Is there a plan to start, John? Is there a plan? There's a great plan to start. <laughs> <laughs> is there a date or a date? <laughs> oh, now we're the specifics. I know it, before we <laughs> talked about September 1st, but that's long gone. Well, yeah, I think what, what, what's interesting is that there's the food's out there, the meat is out there, the support is out there. And I think, the, like, for example, it's Christina's department, there's a lot of energy to get things done. Yeah. We just need to be able to focus on our issue, which in this place is food insecurity for seniors and their you know, multi generation families. It's honing in on that. I think it's there. I think we'll have a cogent presentation to make the city council. Christine's offered to help. Jeff at Parks and Rec is offered to help. So there's mm-hmm. lots of energy behind it. Just, wow. And the focus is getting better. Yeah. That, that's the main thing. We're getting closer to, I think it's going to come down to food insecurity for multi generational families because then we can combine resources. Yeah. All the resources inside the human services department. I can see that, what we have to do that. Yeah. That, that. That came up in the last meeting was a really big find for us. The support's here, we just have to focus it down. Who do we best support? Okay. And one quick suggestion I made was that we can utilize the um, something as simple as the Friday folders from the school department. We could put information about mm-hmm. food availability in the folders to pass on to the parents and grandparents or whatever. And hopefully that would help us with multi-generational families getting the information out. Correct. And we could do it in English and Spanish. And Ronnie, you're in agreement with this for Saturday mornings? And we were looking at starting with one Saturday month. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. One Saturday yeah. month. Yeah, and then we'll see where that, what would See where it goes for like, what, six months or something? Yeah. yeah, so we'll put it in an evaluation period. Yeah. Um, that we do everything, right, just to uh-huh. see. Um, the need, you know, for meeting the need, assessing the need, um, and be able to make decisions based off of that information. That's but, great. But yes, um, yeah. you know, working with John and I appreciate John and Arlene's help with all of this. Um, you know, conversations that we've had to 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 get move, move this work forward, um, and and that's that's where we landed. That's that would make that that made the most most sense with space, um, staff. And, and availability in our facility. So yes, for Saturday. Good. Okay. okay. Actually, John, uh, you folks, you you've done a good job, really, Howard. Yeah. And yeah. You're yeah. further along than I thought you would be. Actually, honestly, that's good to hear. I, I have a better maybe I have a better perception of how difficult it is for the government. Baby steps. Baby steps. Right. Yeah. Good work, you guys. Okay. All right, uh, let's see. Got seven minutes left. Let's see how we should do this. Um, <clears throat> election of officers. This will just take a minute. Ah, Christina escaped. Um, I asked her, and she was going to give me an answer, and she probably forgot about it. Election of officers. Uh, normally, that's supposed to be done after the board is uh, appointed, you know, on new boards, which would be January. And I was thinking, I'll, I'll ask your opinion, and we'll do it either way that you want. But I was thinking, uh, if we do it in January, if we have two or three new members, you got two or three members voting on um, people you don't know for, for the officers. And so maybe it would be better to do that in December say the end of the meeting in December. And so uh, I asked Christina that same question and she said, uh, well, she was gonna talk to the city clerk. I guess I just didn't talk to her. What do you think about that? Well, or would you rather just stick with January like we've done it before or what? So Dave, your bylaws actually say your annual meeting is in February, which would be the time that you would elect your, your officers. So are you saying we want to change that? No, we've done it in January uh, for the last 
a few years. Yeah, you know, I know what you're saying about February, but um, and I guess we can do that if you want to wait until February. But but what I read in the ordinance was it's done after the appointment of the members, the new members. But you're saying it also specifically it says, says February. February? Mm -hmm. The election is February. The annual meeting. The annual meeting. Okay. Yeah, the annual meeting election. is in February. When you would but we haven't done it that way, so it's been in yeah. January. Dave, who are the four applicants for the board? I don't know. Uh, let's see, Eric. Well, I, <clears throat> I don't. I don't know if we can share that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Probably. All right. Okay. Well, last time we we actually got copies of the um, their applications. That the city clerk said we could have. So okay, let, and let me look into that. Um, I'll check into that yeah. and see if it is for. And if so, I can send it out to the board. Um, or if it is just is it or is it just those who are participating in the interview? I'll find out that answer, and I can communicate that out hopefully. Okay. 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 Well, <clears throat> I guess we'll just table that then. It certainly yeah. would have. It would be. Uh, Christina didn't have any problem with it, but she, like I say, she was going to check with the city clerk. But we can we can defer that to the next meeting. Is that because you want only people who know the current group? Oh, uh, that was my thinking. Yeah. But we don't have to do it that way. It's just a thought. Because I know at the first meeting that I had, we voted on the on the new officer, and <laughs> I didn't know what he was looking. Dave, I think. Um, February being my first month um, doing the minutes, mm -hmm. it was done in February mm -hmm. because right. I wasn't present for that time. Well, if we're going to do it according to the uh, ordinance, I suppose we need to do it in February then. I still think it's good for the board to start thinking about um, recommendations for each role, board role. Um, so come February. You know, it helps that process. Yeah, it'll give us a little more time. You know, there's different. You know, how should we do this? Should we just uh, like we did it before? We just throw it open to the floor and ask for nominations, and we close the nominations, and we vote on whoever we got. Worked pretty well before. Yeah. We could do it like Friends. The Friends group formed a nominating committee, and they went through all that stuff, and then they made a recommendation to the full board, and then they voted on it. That seems like a lot of monkey business. I like, I like, you know, we know the people on the board here. Yeah. Right? Okay. It's, it's mm -hmm. easier to go yeah. out. I'm a little bit of formality. Make the nominations necessary. and elect them. Right? Yeah. 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 Oh. Okay. All right. So we'll <clears throat> leave it the way uh, we've been doing it before and possibly do it in February rather than January. And we'll leave that until next, next time after we've had a chance to talk to Christina. So I guess the way it stands, we have it, we do it at the annual meeting in February. That's one more meeting. All right. <clears throat> uh, on the reports, uh, does anybody want to add anything to the reports? Mine just to do with me. I'll do I'll do mine real quick. Be okay. mindful of time. I'll just okay. stop the key things that we have in my report. Mm -hmm. uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions and catch me after. Uh, but you know, key, key things January 1st board meeting, we moved that to January 2nd. And based on uh, senior center availability, it will not be in this room, it'll be in room D down the hall by the billiard room. Same time 10 to 12, but we went from Jan January 1 to January 2. Uh, did, but did we decide to do it on the, the following Wednesday? Did we talk about that? The board, yes, so we, we discussed it last board meeting. To I don't attend. remember that. I thought we were going to decide whether we're going to do it the next day or the Perfect. following week. What do you want to do? <laughs> Let's talk about it now then. What do you want to do? Well, so yeah. instead of moving it to Thursday, we move it to the following Wednesday? Yeah, which would be uh, January 8th. Okay. Well, then who thinks we should move it to Thursday? I am here. Yeah, I, I think I'm I got I got one problem. I asked. Uh, uh, Michelle Webb from the Boulder County um, uh, Mental Health Behavioral Health Roadmap she's working on. And I asked her to come and speak to us on January 8th. Uh, that can be changed. But I got that set for January 8th. Do you want to vote on January 8th? Uh, I don't know. Let me see. What do you think? Well, how many people would like to see it 
on January 2nd. I would, because I've got a conflict potentially on the year. Mm. Okay. How many people would like to see it on the 12th? Or the, the 12th? The 12th. Yeah. Well, does anybody care? I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. 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 If we can, yeah. if nobody really cares, then we'll stick with the second because then Eric can participate. All right. I guess we gotta check on. Uh, I'll, I'll have to change it with Michelle Webb. Okay. You know. uh, and maybe she can't make it that, that day, but uh, that's fine. Maybe the board can vote on option one. <clears throat> Pending that that response, move into the second option two. Okay. Wait, all into. right. Let's just let's just vote on it. Let's have a motion saying let's have the the the, the meeting for January on January second. All right. I'll make that motion. Okay, is there a second to that motion. motion? Okay, Eric seconds it. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? January 2nd it is. Okay. Yeah. So January 2nd, room D, <coughs> 9, 10 to 12. So again, by the, the room by the billiard room. Okay. Uh, board in, in review updates, we do have our two board members helping, well, our identified board members helping an interview November 13th. And we discuss, I'll talk to um, City Clerk's office about applications to see if we can share that with the full board. So I'll check that and uh, communicate by email the response I get. Friends Board, good news. Friends Board with your support, uh, advisory board. Friends Board has voted and approved on two new vehicles for senior service trips starting in 2025. That'll move us to four total vehicles. The uh, whole purpose of that is to uh, alleviate our wait list and get more guests mm -hmm. participating on our on our trips. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. That is just excellent. Yeah. Yes. Excellent work. They're yeah. running a great presentation to get them over the edge. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I just congratulations to both of you. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. That's are they both going to be ADA? They are. Well, and actually, let me double check. Well, they're ADA compliant, yes. Um, yes is the answer. Will they have layup? So the lift, we are doing one. One lift, so that gives back us back or front. Uh, it's a back lift, so that's the same as our current vehicles. Vehicle that we have, we have one with the lift, one without. Um, so now we will have two vehicles with lifts. So okay, it's, so by, it's by the back same layout. By back, it means up back on the side. Back on back. the side. That is correct. Is there any thought given to putting it in the front, which is more convenient? We'd have to look at our budget. So we've been approved for two hundred thousand dollars for two vehicles, so it's a hundred thousand dollars for each vehicle. So we have to look at where that would that would fall. I haven't in the research that I've done. I haven't seen any um, with our need, meaning uh, a fourteen passenger vehicle that has a front lift. So we we have some things to consider on that one. So, but really, what what this puts us it puts us in a position to do is duplicate the two vehicles we have again: one with a lift, one without a lift, both ADA compliant and fourteen passenger vehicles. So. Um, that we're, we're excited about that. We're working with Fleet right now to get that purchase movement forward. Full-time bilingual office assistant position uh, has been posted. We have nine candidates, and I will be setting up interviews here in the near future, within this month of November here in the near future, to get uh, those interviews going and get that position filled. So I'm very excited to have that. That's our own vacancy right now. And I'll end on this one. Amy Hodge, our rec Senior Recreation Program Supervisor, uh, has received the Colorado Parks and Recre Recreation Association, CPRA, uh, 2024 Marine Logan, I'm sorry, Mary Ann Logan Active Adult Professional of the Year Award. Uh, she was nominated, nominated and selected by her professional peers in the industry to recognize Amy's dedication to her work serving the seniors in our long Island community. So it's really good to see. We get, we get the privilege of seeing the work she does for us every single day in person and to see that her work is being acknowledged outside of the senior center and the community of Long Lot uh, amongst peers, her, her professional peers in the state of Colorado is fantastic. So very, very, a very great award for her to receive and very one that's very much well deserving. So she, she earned it for sure. Yes. Good for her. Great. Yeah. Great. I think a nice thing would be for the at the next meeting that we have a card of congratulations and we all sign it separately. That's good. And give it to her. So I'll bring that in. Okay. Good idea. Sure I really appreciate that. Yeah. 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 So it was just it speaks to the volume. You know, uh, John had mentioned it earlier. The dedication that our team has to serving 
the community of Longmont, and it's you know we're we're very fortunate to have a group of professionals in senior services, but collectively in the city of Longmont as well. So very fantastic, very very proud of her. And um, two quick ones. Well, I'll end on those, but just these are quick ones. Um, the Native American heritage. Her Native American Heritage Month celebration. Uh, last Saturday was a huge success. We had our door counter counted over 300 visits. We, we have to categorize that, categorize it as visits because people are, yes, people are coming and going, but people are coming in and exiting different doors. So um, if you were here, we, we had a good amount of board members. We had Arlene here, Anna's here, Eric, and uh, you were here, right? Mm -hmm. just kidding, I'm just kidding. Joking. Yes. John, I was joking. John was all over the place. That's why I'm joking with John. Um, it was fantastic. Those in attendance. And, and, and Maria was here. Maria was helping yeah, serve Maria. some food. Yes. She had that giant line. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, so, yes. And so, I mean, we had a great advisory board turnout. Uh, and um, it was just such a fantastic event. This is the first one I've done here where we partnered in the community to do an intergenerational program. And, um, you know, Ch CYF, Children and Family, has, ha has had success with this with just youth, but we've for sure doubled the attendance, if not tripled it, from what they've had in the past. And again, and I wanted to highlight those who are in attendance can speak to uh, the, the amount of people we had in this building. Who's the private? It was the fried bread, <laughs> authentic fried bread, right? From our yeah, northern, right, right, our, right. our northern rep, little friends from Wyoming, came down to provide um, uh, to to cook for everybody yeah, in attendance, and so it was just yes, yeah, it really was. Awesome. Awesome. So, I just very proud of that event and our our, our community turnout and the support that we've had. So um, now I'll end on that. I appreciate you all for everything you do. So thank you. I have All right. one quick question. Do uh, you have any idea what the numbers look like for the, the telephone tutoring by Valerie? And the, which one, sorry? Aren't, aren't they doing tutoring in Spanish for for her seniors with the cell phones? Yeah, so Valerie has a, a program set up. I have not had a chance to uh, connect with her on, uh, on how that's going with that. Looks like I'll, I'll come. Oh, okay. I just got curious. <clears throat> oh, I don't, yeah. Okay. She's doing fantastic though, with uh, collectively with our, our Spanish programs. Yeah. Uh, she's doing a really fantastic job. All right, any other business before this group today? Yes. Um, for senior citizens, I mean, excuse me, for the AAC, the Boulder County Agency and Agent Report, um, I put everything in here, submissions for requests for funding from the state are now going on, and there's a whole process that you can see that um, they go through. But the big thing is we're planning our strategy for the Older American Day at the Capitol, which mm -hmm. is Tuesday, February 13th. Um, we had some advocacy discussions. We broke up into three groups and discussed how to present the issues listed and to talk with elected officials. We decided to invite the legislators that we would like to talk to to a breakfast that morning, hosted at the Capitol by us. And we'll be fine-tuning plans for this meeting with elected, elected officials. So if anybody has any input they want to give on what you think should be discussed with electric, elected officials on the state level, let me know. Um, we'll talk about it again in December, but be prepared. <clears throat> be prepared if you want to bring up any issues, if you want to present any ideas, and I'd be happy to take it back to the AAC and, and bring it up as another, you know, something else that we could add to our list. And remember, we have uh, Sandra Cedar coming next week, uh, next yes. month. Now, who is she? She's a deputy city manager. Okay. So on that um, legislative day, that Via, if, I, if there was a group of people, you know, a bunch of Nice group of people from Longwood that wanted to go via would provide transportation. So yeah, I was just well, going to ask that. Something to, to, something to think about. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't realize that. Because mm -hmm. that way, you know, you don't have to worry about where or you're going to car. Park. Yeah. yeah. All right. Any other business? Uh, good. Good work, people. Good work. Okay. All right. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. Uh, John and uh, Eric. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much.